Quiet! Quiet. <laughs> Action! <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you for coming tonight. We're glad to see so many of uh, you made it out here tonight. And uh, I think you're in for a real learning experience tonight. And I hope that a lot of you will decide to join with PDA and uh, forming a state committee and working on a uh, move to amend. Now PDAs, what we call it is uh, amend to suspend corporate person, but that's what we call our IOT, PDA. And you call PDA the Progressive Democrats? Of yes. Democrats. Yes, but we're not part of the Democratic Party, so don't get hung up on that. Because <laughs> too many people get hung up on the Democrat and, uh, I mean, um, you know, we do work for Greens and Independents. The only thing is that we can't endorse them according to our tax uh, filing status. But, um, you know, so don't get hung up on the Democrat. Get hung up on the Progressive end. <laughs> That's what I want you to get hung up on. I'm the state coordinator for uh, New Jersey for the Progressive Democrats of America. And um, one of the other things that I wanted, besides the, having David Cobb here tonight, to speak to you about uh, Move to Amend, um, is New Jersey can't. And this is a statewide um, movement that we have here in New Jersey that uh, we're trying to bring unions, community organization, activists, and just plain concerned citizens all together under one roof to uh, form a powerful movement to take back New Jersey. I'm sure that a lot of you know what has happened recently with uh, you know, the stripping of eliminate, you know, on the collective bargaining rights um, with the public workers, and there's so much misinformation out there um, that we need to correct. You know, just like they're saying that, you know, the workers didn't pay into the pension fund. Well, that's not the story. The real story is the workers have been paying in, the state hasn't been paying in their fair share, <coughs> excuse me, 11 out of the last 15 years. John Corzine and I, in 2008 and 2009, were the last uh, two uh, contributions to the pension fund for the state. Um, but for some reason, go ahead. Do you have the petition going around? We have it here on the table. And, uh, but I also am looking for volunteers to take some petitions back to your local areas tonight, try to get them signed. There's an address on the bottom to send them to when they're filled. But it's, like I said, it's a statewide movement bringing all groups together under one umbrella to uh, work on taking back New Jersey. Right now, our, and this is long term, we're not just talking about right at the moment. We're talking about building a movement for years to come. And right now, our first three actions that we're taking, one is the petition to remove the state uh, Senate President Sweeney and to remove uh, Speaker Sheila Oliver from their leadership positions prior to the elections. Why? Because we already know during the linked up session, they have planned, they are stacking bills right now that are ALEC bills. I'm sure you all know who ALEC is. They're stacking ALEC bills right now that they can, they're going to pass during the lame duck session. Better explain ALEC. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, like, think just simple New Jersey yeah. sorts of things. More privatization of the schools. More privatization. There's going to be a lot back of Back door school things. vouchers, doing away with our I public think schools. I ALEC. that's basically, you know what the Koch brothers are? I know what ALEC is. Okay. <laughs> But ALEC is uh, it's an organization that they all they come together all these different um, well, industries. In, industries or and influential people and they are establishing legislation. All right, and the, their they, their members are taking like they have a lot of uh, I think there's four of them that they have here in New Jersey on their what uh, ALEC chapters no members no members four members in our legislature. Okay, just in our legislature that they have, that are pressing, pushing their bills. Just Google Alec. And uh, you know, I don't want to really get into Alec, okay? We don't have that much time. We don't have that much time for me to get into uh, Alec. But uh, anyway, they're very, you know, destructive bills, and they're Koch brothers in all corporation sponsored bills, all to the benefit to destroy our environment, destroy our schools, to. Uh, you know, regulations. Right, cut back regulations. Destroy EPA. And just, yeah, that's what I said. Environment, all these things. Uh, 
And there, there's a whole bunch of these bills that they've gotten passed out of the committees, all right? And they're sitting there now to be voted on during Lame Duck. And if you think what happened here in June was bad, what will you see what happens during Lame Duck, okay? And we know right now this is the most important thing we have to do is to get Sweeney and, and just all, all over out of their leadership positions because we feel that if we can get Dick Cody or someone else in to leadership position, these bills are not going to see the light of day as before in the New Jersey legislature. Okay? Our second thing that we're working on is writing candidates. Um, if there's somebody that is running on the ballot that you know that is progressive, yes, we support them. But we are looking especially to find write-in candidates to run against any of the Christie Pratts. And uh, we have information here. You can pick it up. And it uh, shows you who the Christie Kratz are over here. And uh, if you want to try to run, or if you know somebody that you want to put up as a write-in candidate, please let us know. Um, we have a lot of union members who are working on, you know, pushing these write-in candidates. Our third one, which is uh, a recall of Christie. And uh, fortunately in New Jersey, we don't have to have grounds, but fortunately we have uh, lots of grounds to recall him. Lots of criminal actions that we can prove. And um, I have an attorney that is willing to come up out of Washington, D.C. and do town halls across the whole state and explain all the criminal actions that Christie's been involved with. Uh, so that's it. We're not going to be working on the recall probably until after elections, but the most important one right now, we need that petition to be moved. And we need lots of signatures, like today. Okay? And nj-can.org NJ, uh, is our website. Go there, sign up. Uh, you can print out extra petitions, talking points, whatever you might need. I do have talking points with me tonight in a flyer that you can also use. Um, but anyway, now on to our program. And it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, someone who has been an activist probably as long as me. <laughs> I don't know, Dan, you've been four years. Um, but anyway, he's um, you know he's been uh, he's sued corporate uh, polluters. He's lobbied elected elected officials. He's run for public office himself. In fact, he ran for the president of the United States under the Green Party in 2004. And this gentleman had the guts to do something that our own Democrats couldn't even do. And that was when, in 2004, in the Ohio vote. This man was the one to call for the recount because he knew something was wrong. Right. I think he deserves it. Right. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce David Cobb. Thank you, John. All right, great job. And thank you, Mary Ellen, and thank you, Tim, as well, for helping to put this together. You know, at the start of all these, I like to say that I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days, I am a pissed off American citizen. Yeah. All right, good. Good. I like to make sure that I'm in the right place. And even deeper than that, I think I self identify as a progressive. And I think that we as progressives are making a mistake when we allow the Tea Party to cl claim some monopoly on righteous political outrage in this country. Yeah. Yes. You know, because we've, I've had the opportunity to actually talk to some of these uh, Tea Party adherents, if I can get to any substance with them. What I will often find is that they articulate an anger about the fact that the big banks and Wall Street America and these big corporations destroyed the economy of the United States of America, and then the federal government rewarded them with trillions of tax dollars. Well, guess what? I'm mad about that, too. And I don't think that we should allow either the media or the body politic in general to think that only the Tea Party speaks to the righteous outrage about the fact that the corporatists have destroyed this economy and that the federal government under both Bush and Obama are basically rewarding them. We just can't let that happen. There's got to actually be a progressive voice speaking out against it. And I do want to say and underscore that this is a moral outrage. You know, it's okay to be outraged about the fact that a quarter of the children of the United States of America go to bed hungry at night. In fact, we should be angry about that. Because moral outrage comes from ethics. 
It comes from a sense of justice and fairness. And I'll submit to you that it was moral outrage that actually provoked and propelled the abolitionists to stand up against the depraved institution of slavery when all the rest of the country, the culture, the politics, uh, the economics, everything said it had to be like that, but it was morality that actually fueled the abolitionists. It was a sense of moral injustice that actually fueled those women who gathered together at Seneca Falls. It was a commitment to moral outrage that actually led the civil rights movement and the trade union movement. We ought to be proud to be morally outraged. Right? Yes. right. We got to be proud of it. And we got to understand that if we get angry and stay mired in angry anger, that is a very dangerous emotionally spiritually and psychologically placed to be. We cannot just get angry and stay angry. We've got to let our anger actually provoke, propel us to righteous action. And for me, that's actually what has led me to this place today, why I am here on a five-week tour of this country. And sometimes I think the way I actually ought to be introducing all of these talks is to say where I am now, New Jersey, where was it? <laughs> Greetings, New Jersey. I bring you greetings from the cell of resistance in New York City. <laughs> because I am here to tell you there is a growing movement around this country, a growing movement of people just like you who recognize it, that there is a problem and we need to get active. And so what I'm going to do in my best ability is to actually tell you the truth as I see it and make some suggestions on what I believe is the proper way forward. And here's what I'm going to start by saying. The truth is, the United States of America is not now, nor has it ever been. In fact, it wasn't actually designed to be a functioning democratic republic. That is a very difficult thing for some people to hear, but it is also the truth. And so, in our very short time period, I'm going to, as my grandfather would say, who was a Baptist preacher, I'm going to just tell a story. I'm going to tell a story that, as I understand it, how it came to be that the transnational corporations have actually hijacked this country. They've hijacked the, the legislatures. They've hijacked the legal system. They've hijacked the media institutions. They've basically hijacked everything, and they, they pretend as if this is a democracy when, in fact, it's not. So, in order to do that, there are four basic concepts that I'm going to cover. The first one is the word democracy. That gets thrown around a lot, but just so we can be clear about it, somebody tell me what language this is from? Greek. 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 Uh, Dorothy, can you break it down for sure. me? Sure. Demo, the people. The Christy, people. Rule by. The people rule. <laughs> or the people govern. That's what it means, right? Does anybody believe that we, the people, are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. I do this presentation all over the country, and virtually nobody is actually willing to stand up and say, we the people are actually ruling in any way. That's a problem. And that leads me to the second concept, actually, which is sovereignty. Anybody give a quick uh, definition? How about this? What if I just had the word sovereign? What does that make you think of? The sovereign? King. And that's because, or ruler, because the word sovereignty actually means the authority to rule. That's what the word means. And the reason that at one time the word sovereign and king were synonymous is because the king was the ultimate ruler. And by the way, where did the king claim his authority? God. You don't get more legitimate. <laughs> right? I mean, if you can actually assert that your right to rule comes from God on high and have everybody else believe it, that's something. Let's do a little pop, a little exercise, if you will. This is always fun for me. You'll see. Now I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. David Cobb is the king. And as the king, he is God's representative on earth. And as the king, he is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything David says must be obeyed. <laughs> therefore, everything David says must be obeyed. Okay, you can open your eyes. No way, no way. <laughs> no way. All right, so a couple of quick observations. From the very beginning, as soon as y'all realized what I was doing, you all snickered, right? This woman crossed her arms. She actually scowled at me. This fellow here sort of made a, a face like he was biting a lemon. At the end of it, what's your name, sister? Carol. Carol actually refused and shouted out against me. And all of you were laughing, right? You know why? 
Because it's stupid, right? I mean, that, that is really outrageous. That is a, a ridiculous idea that I could claim that, not, that, that you should all live your lives in a certain way. Not only you individually, but that the entire society ought to be organized in a certain way simply because I said so. And why? Because I happen to be born into a certain position? That's outrageous. That's ludicrous. And 500 years ago, people just like you believed it. And the reason that I really want to drive this home is to make us come to terms with the fact that profound transformation can happen in our culture. Deep transformation is possible. Because it's not as if those people 500 years ago were somehow defective. It was their culture. And they believed it. But we don't believe it now. You know, I do work all across the country. And, uh, you know, I'm a personally a Green, but I work with Democrats. I work with Socialists. I work with Communists. I work with Anarchists. I work with Independents. I work with Libertarians. I've never met a Monarchist. <laughs> the point I'm making is we can't even wrap our heads around that. And yet, not so long ago in human history, everybody believed it. Another way to say it, and I'm going to get a little metaphysical on you here and say... We are all jointly participating in creating the reality that we're experiencing. Because if enough people think something is true, if enough people act like something is true, it must be true. It's true, yeah. right? It becomes true, Elliot. And so the reason I'm saying that is I am really sick and tired of hearing people tell me, oh, we can't actually end war as foreign policy because that's the way it is. Oh, we can't actually confront the inherently racist society that we live in because it's just too deep. Oh, we can't actually deal with the patriarchy uh, that, that has actually been part of it. That's not true. The reality is we can actually make fundamental transformational change if enough of us think that something is true, if enough of us act like something is true, it can become true. true. And so I guess what I'm going to do is really challenge each and every one of us to actually ask, are we really acting commiserate with the problems that face us today? Because part of the, another part of my truth-telling is to acknowledge that the United States of America is a profoundly racist, sexist, and class oppressive society and the social, political, and economic institutions are destroying the planet that we all depend on for survival. That's deep and it's true and we better damn well do something about it quickly. That's going to bring me to my third point actually which is the concept of legal personhood. Now uh, you'll notice that I didn't put corporate personhood here but legal personhood. That's because the concept of personhood, especially legally personhood, is very important because it really means that you have the that you have the ability to assert rights. If you're ah now see somebody is already adding two and two. The ability to assert rights is a very profound idea in the concept of, of law, especially Western idea. And the last concept is corporation. And in some respects, it's last because it's the least important, but in other respects, it's also the most important. Uh, by that, I mean it's the most important in some sense because I'll tell you, we don't have a democracy today, in fact, because of corporations. Because frankly, folks, corporations are not merely exercising power in the United States of America. They are ruling us. Unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives. They are literally making decisions about how much toxins will be spewed into the water that we all collectively drink, how much poison is in the air that we all collectively breathe. They're making the decisions about how much health care we'll get or ever more how much we won't get. They're making the decisions about whether or not this country goes to war or not. The reality is that we are left to choose between paper or plastic, uh, Coke or Pepsi. We're given all these sort of consumer choices, and, and that is supposed to actually be some sort of exercising of power or ruling. It's not. Ruling, self-rule, would actually be participating in a meaningful way in the decisions that affect our lives. And that's actually, I think, what our real challenge is. Now, why is corporation the least important concept here? Because frankly, it's about us. At the end of the day, my challenge to each and every one of you that I ask myself every day when I get up is, 
Am I actually taking myself seriously? Am I conducting myself in a way that is both, uh, both has integrity and is also acting as if I believe that I have the authority to rule, that I am actually a participant in a meaningful way in a social movement that actually uh, I want to be part of. Now, just as I asked what language democracy is from, I'll now ask what language is the word corporation from? It's from Latin. And that's the same way we did that. Can we break that down, Dorothy? Corpus? How about this? Body. Okay, and now for extra credit points. <laughs> Making into a body. Perfect. T-I-O-N, the suffix means the inherent state of having or to make or to create. Literally, the word corporation means to create or have body. And you know, that's important for a number of reasons. First of all, let me ask, any other lawyers in this crowd besides me? Don't be shy. This is a friendly crowd. What was the question again? Any lawyers? Okay. All right. So let me just tell you, in law school, in that class, the first thing they teach you is that a corporation is a legal fiction. Hmm? What does that mean exactly? Well, what does the word fiction mean? Fake. Non fake. Not true. Right. So check it out. A corporation is fake. It's not true. It doesn't exist. But we're going to pretend like it does. We're going to act like it so that we'll give it a body. We'll create it out of whole cloth. And guess what? If enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like something is true, it, it be true. becomes true. So the idea is that under a corporation, you create a con you take a construct. It's a construct. And but when you create this construct, then you can act a certain way under law. Now. The other reason this word is important, or the fact that it's uh, from Latin, is because the first corporations, as we would understand them, actually were created during the Roman Republic, not the Roman Empire. And I often wish that we had enough time to really ask the question, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States of America today. Uh, but maybe that will come up during the discussion. Uh, so the other reason that the word corporation is so important is because the first corporations ever created by the genius of humans was during the Roman Republic. For example, it was, y'all heard the adage, all roads lead to Rome, right? Sure. Those roads were actually laid out, conceived of, built and maintained by one of the first corporations. Likewise, the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that moved water all across the Italian peninsula without electricity, which is another thing to say, Humans are very creative. We're very clever. We can solve all the problems that face us. As horrible as they are, there are solutions to these, but we the people don't actually control our own institutions. Likewise, uh, the first hospitals were actually designed, administered under the rubric of a corporation. The first hospitals, the first universities, Roman corporations. Does anybody see anything in common with a road system, a water system, a hospital, a university? Public use. Public Louder, sir. Public use. They're public use. All of these were actually public uses or public functions. So the genius of the corporation originally was to take voluntary money, material, creativity, human effort, amass it in one place and put it to a public use. Right? And I want to be clear about it. That really is a genius idea to be able to actually do that, to amass both capital and, and creativity and sweat equity and, and put it to some sort of public use. And the way it works is something like this. Let's say I, I, I've got this really great idea for how a, there can be an elaborate system of community supported agriculture that would be publicly owned and operated to create a public organic food supply. We're going to put tens of thousands of unemployed young people to work, both growing and distributing food. It's going to be fantastic and, and uh, all of society uh, will benefit. But, and I've got this incredible plan. I've got all these people on board, but I just need a little bit of capital money to make it happen. Can I get $100 from you to make that happen? Yes, sir. He says yes. Could I get $100 from you? Can I get $100 from you? No way. No, no, no way. Could I, is there any way I can entice you? Maybe a return on your investment? Anything like that? That sounds reasonable. Reasonable. All right. So I'll, I'll work out with you. How about you? No. No. Is there anything I can do to entice you? No. 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 Nothing at all? Nothing. All right. So how about you? And I go on. All right. So you see that? Voluntarily trying to take money. 
Now, the reason I'm going really under to underscore this is this is not the first time that private money is collected from citizens to do some public thing, right? Before corporations, those were called taxes. The difference is, the difference is, when the centurion shows up to collect taxes, either then or today, does the centurion say, listen, here's what we're going to plan on doing with this. Would you please be willing to pay it? No, they don't do that. And then whenever somebody says no, you say, well, can I entice you to pay? Or if somebody says, I refuse to pay, okay, we go on to the next. No, the tax system, the spear goes up to the throat. You're compelled to pay. The genius of the corporation is that it takes private money, private material, private effort on a voluntarily basis. There actually is a genius to that idea. But the problem, of course, is that the modern transnational corporation doesn't exactly work like that, does it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually doesn't have its root in the period of the Roman Republic and that concept. Instead, it was born during the 13th, 14th, and 15th century of the United States. You know, the age of discovery. Because the 13th, and 14th, and 15th century of world history was not really about discovery, was it? I mean, after all, what did they discover? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash, there were people living there. They weren't lost. <laughs> they didn't need to be discovered. So the reality is, let's just, I told y'all that we were going to tell the truth. It's empire. It is empire. And another way to say it is rape, it is pillage, it is plunder, it is murder, it is theft. It is the intentional, deliberate effort to go out conquer other people, steal their resources. In fact, the East India Corporation was in fact designed very specifically to militarily conquer the subcontinent of India and not only to conquer those people in a military way and physically take them over, but to literally destroy their culture, destroy their existing institutions and make them dependent upon European institutions to not only colonize their bodies, but to colonize their minds, to make them dependent. And I think that today we ought to be asking ourselves, have we been colonized? Have our minds been colonized? Colonized? <laughs> so, the, the reason that I think it's important to understand that this idea of the joint stock company or the large corporation comes out of this time period is because it was an instrument of colonization and imperialism. Literally, the creation of these institutions known as joint stock companies, the modern transnational corporation, not business, but the modern transnational corporation was literally an instrument of empire. It wasn't just the East India Company, but there was also one called the Africa Trading Company. Does anybody want to guess what the Africa Trading Company mm -hmm. traded? People. Thank you. Elliot, say it. People. People. Because I think, frankly, that the word slaves abstracts it. It's not as if Africa was populated by slaves. Right? I mean, we've got to really understand that the use of language is really important. So I would tell you that the Africa Trading Company engaged in the commodification and the trading of people. And I would say people basically just like me. Now, I say that fully aware of my pigment. I'm not stupid. But I say it because I made a commitment that I'd tell the truth. And if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, they'll tell you race does not exist. I mean, skin color exists, hair color exists, pigments exist, uh, ethnicities exist. But no scientist would elevate that to a taxonomy. Nobody would, they, they, they'd just say that's foolish, that doesn't make sense under science. But guess what? Race doesn't exist, but racism damn sure does. Why? Well, because if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like something is true, it's true. It's true. And the reason I'm going down this particular avenue is to challenge you to consider this, that the idea of race gets created during the era of imperialism just as the joint stock company or the transnational corporation gets in, created during that same, t same time period. And race gets created, why? To justify the idea of slavery. Now, slavery had always existed, or had existed before then, right? Uh, 
Uh, for example, if uh, let's say Elliot and I are in different tribes before the creation of the concept of race, um, and there's a river separating us, and my tribe goes to war against Elliot's tribe, and my tribe wins, and why might my tribe win? Because I'm telling the story. And I want you to think about how important it is because whoever is telling you the story has an inordinate amount of power. And we ought to actually be questioning that and thinking, who is telling us this whenever we're watching corporate media? I refuse to even call it mainstream media anymore. I mean, NBC is actually the General Electric Corporation. ABC is actually the Disney Corporation. CBS is actually the Westinghouse Corporation. I mean, these are, these are uh, huge transnational corporate conglomerations to begin with, right? But I'm telling the story, so unfortunately for you, Elliot, my side wins, so I put a spear to Elliot's throat and I say, you are now my slave. Now let me ask you folks, what is the justification, the, the moral and ethical justification of my ability to enslave Elliot? Power. The power, the weapon, might makes right. There's no other, even as just naked, brutal power. The point I really want to underscore here is that the concept of race gets created during the period of imperialism, during the period of the rise of the corporation, in order to justify the idea of enslaving an entire group of people on no other basis other than pigment. It's all inextricably linked. And in fact, the great American, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. actually said it in what I wish was his most famous speech. You know, his most famous speech is probably the I Have a Dream. And it's a beautiful speech. It really is. It's stirring. It's, it's fantastic. It, 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 it is iconic. But the speech that I wish that he was remembered for, the one I think he deserves to be remembered for, is the speech he delivered at the Riverside Church in Harlem. The one that's called Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam, where he talked about the triple evils of extreme uh, materialism, militarism, and racism. In fact, he said those triple evils, if they are not confronted, will lead any country, this country, to a social and moral decay. And I'm telling you, my belief, my sincere belief, not only was King right, he was right then, he's right now, and that it had its roots in the same reality. Imperialism, racism, and corporatism are all inextricably linked to the idea of conquest and oppression and stealing resources from other people. Now, fast forward to this country, because of course this country, upon we're, we're all taught it's, being, it, it's, be, it's created by how many colonies? 13. 13 originally colonies. By the way, those are colonies. Colonies, colonialism, that might be important. Flag that. But the 13 original colonies, how many of those were actually corporations? It's a trick question. All of them. In one sense, every one of them. Why do I say that? Why? Because they were created. Who actually created Massachusetts? The king. Right? Now, some people say, no, it existed beforehand. No. The land existed. The forest existed, the rivers existed, the fish that swam in the rivers, the, the, the people and deer uh, that lived in those forests, the birds that flew overhead. Reality existed, but it took the king writing a charter to create Massachusetts. Which is another way to say, actually, those lines on a map are just lines on a map. Another thing to think about, just planting seeds. But... The king, when he creates Massachusetts, does he create the state of Massachusetts? He didn't create the commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's another trick question. The original creation of Massachusetts was the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony. Likewise, the king did not create the state of Virginia. He created the Virginia Company. These were for-profit corporations, joint stock companies that were created by the king by a corporate charter. In fact, most of the original colonies were in one way or another uh, joint stock companies or they were land grants given as patronage, right? But the king created them all. So in one very real sense, they were all corporations in that sense. But uh, in, in Georgia, by the way, it was a penal corporation. It was literally created as a penal corporation. By the way, what color were most of the original uh, workers of the, that penal corporation? White. They were white. Exactly. So, 
The reason that I'm saying this is because I think it's important to recognize that when the American Revolution, like when the king actually claims that the king is claiming, claiming sovereignty at this point, creates all these new entities, these colonies, uh, but the king doesn't govern them, even though he has the authority to rule. Instead, the king actually appoints somebody to do it. So the first royal governors of those colonies actually were, in, another way to think about them are CEOs. Right? You see? You see? And so, for example, now, Elliot, it's good to sit where you're sitting because I'll be the king, and why am I the king? Because you're telling a story. You're paying attention. <laughs> I'm telling a story. So I get to be the king, and as the king, I am now going to create the Massachusetts Commonwealth, but I will now, or pardon me, the Massachusetts Bay Trading Colony, and I will appoint Elliot to be my royal governor. And I say, Elliot, you are charged now, and this is what the charter said, <laughs> to plant, rule, and govern in my name and to benefit the shareholders. That's what you're charged with doing. And so, in a very real way, when the American revolutionaries rise up against the king, they're not just throwing off the idea of the divine right of kings. They're not merely throwing off uh, that system of rule. It's also, in one respect, a people's uprising against unelected and unaccountable CEO rule. I mean, so I just think that we ought to really be thinking about that. The other thing we should think about the American Revolution is that is the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. So maybe today we shouldn't merely call for more socially responsible corporations. Maybe we can raise our aspirations a little higher. Should, are we really going to be content with just begging, oh, please, would you pl please try not to poison us quite so much? Oh, please, would you not destroy the entire ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico? Could you maybe please not kill so many miners in West Virginia? I mean, we could go down the list of the horrific conduct that transnational corporations do day after day after day, and most of the time, what you see in response is tisk tisk, you know, but there's not the kind of reaction or response that I think would be commiserate with the harms that they visit upon us. And I'll tell you another thing. In the 1740s and the 1750s, those people who would become revolutionaries were in fact asking for a more socially responsible king. In fact, they were writing letters that went something like this. Oh dear father king, we your humble and obedient children come before you on bended knee to ask that you intervene on our behalf because your royal governor is oppressing us mightily with unfair laws and the English Parliament are passing unfair trade laws and mercantile laws that are not fair to us. Taxation as well. And so, O oh great and mighty King, we come before you on bended knee to ask that you intervene on our behalf, we, your obedient children. It was the most sniveling, groveling, obsequious language that you can imagine. Read some of those letters. And I don't know about you, but I am keenly interested in finding out what it was that those people said that in 10 to 15 years, those same people found it within themselves to stop the boot kissing, to stand up, to put, as King said, some steel in their backbone, to put their shoulders back, to put their chin up, and to look at the King of England. And where did the King claim his authority? God, and to look past the king and see behind the king the most powerful military the world had ever seen and said, you're done. Get out. That is power. That is self-respect. There is something about the ability to actually stand up for yourself against oppression, against unfairness, and to actually say, ya basta. Enough already. This ain't going down like this any damn more. And I think today, as we are confronted with a corporate class, a predatory class that have hijacked the leadership of both political parties, they have hijacked our legal system, our media institutions, our healthcare institutions, they are basically destroying our planet, and we are supposed to go along with it, I think it's time for us to get up off our knees. I think it's time for us to put some steel in our own backbones. I think it's about time that we looked at actual corporate America and said, you're done, get out, we got another plan. And we can do that. We can do that. 
And of course, the king of England gets thrown out. We know that, that the king is out. A new government gets put in its place. And so now let's very quickly go in to the charter that creates this new government. And what is the charter that creates the government? The supreme law of the land, we're taught? Constitution. The Constitution. So what I'm going to do very quickly is go over the U.S. Constitution and how it's supposed to operate. Anybody read that document in the last year? Several hands go up. Good for you. I'm going to, I'm going to submit this. There are two big constructs within the Constitution. The first one is the most important one. We the people. The second is what we the people actually come together to create. Government. You see, in this document, this framework, we the people are described as being free and sovereign. And again, what does sovereign mean? The authority to rule. We the people have the authority to rule. Another way to say that, government actually is not, does not have the authority to rule over us. Government actually is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. That's got a ring to it, doesn't it? I kind of like that. I like how this is going. We the people are free and sovereign because we have individual rights. Government, by the way, under this framework, does not have rights. Government only has duties. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. All power resides with the people. In fact, that's not just a Black Panther Party chant, although it was. It was also an American Revolutionary chant. All power resides with the people, but we the people delegate a certain amount of power. How much? We delegate a certain amount of power to government, only enough to do the duties that we have already told government, that we have collectively decided that we want government to do in our name through us. Like, I look at this and I think, wow, this is fantastic actually. This is brilliant because it understands that in our private realm, or in my private realm, or your private realm, I have certain rights that are inviolate. In other words, there are certain things that I can say, that I can do, that I can think, and I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need your permission. I don't need the group's permission. I don't need the government's permission at the local, state, or federal level. Another way to think of it is, this framework says the Constitution doesn't create rights, it recognizes rights. Human rights. Core rights. And if government ever actually violates your rights, you're not wrong. Government is wrong. And you should be able to go into court and challenge any governmental action that actually violates your human rights. But it doesn't end there. It's not just a private construct, because there's also an understanding that there is a public realm. That is to say that our libertarian impulses are satisfied as individual human beings who have rights, but we're also part of a communitarian effort. And that we're supposed to collectively, and I would say civilly, figure out how to actually make decisions and implement them. I look at this and I think, my God, this is brilliant. Because it really does protect individual rights and also creates a mechanism for public decision making. This is fantastic. This is beautiful. We should try that in this country. <laughs> this would work. And I'm not even joking. Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how beautiful the Constitution is, time out. What year is this document ratified? Or 1789. Nicely done. You are... Uh, History buff, Nick, or? Yes. Yes. Junkie. Junkie, in fact. <laughs> 1789, says Mr. Mellis, and he is correct. The Constitutional Convention is drafted in secret, by the way, in 1787. It's ratified in 1789. The reason that I put this up here is to remind us of something that we kind of know, but I don't think we raised to the surface often enough, and let's actually do that right now. Who was legally a person? Remember, to be a legal person means that you can assert rights under law. So he gets to be a person in 1789. You have to be white. Freeholders. You have to be male. Landowner. You have to be property owner. So you have to be a white, male, property owner. And in most states, the right religion. You have to be in the right religion, too. So another way to ask this question, or a way to ask this question is, 
then who was legally a person in 1789? We've told the characteristics. Another way to really think about it, what percentage of the adult population were legally persons? I'm not trying to trick you with children. The rich. All right, so what percentage though? What percentage of the adult human beings living here were legally persons? 25%. 25%. 40%. 40%. 1%. The first time somebody who is too cynical. No, <laughs> it's not 1%, it's a whopping 5. Oh 7% at tops. So another way to say that is that 93 to 95% of the human beings, adults living here, were not legally persons. When you say that, you mean that they did not have, they did have the right to vote? Or I something? mean they didn't have the right to vote. They, they, they didn't have any of the rights on so, the Well, so it, it's more complicated than that, obviously, because uh, they, none of them had the right to vote. Uh, some of the white indentured servants were second-class citizens. Uh, so, but in terms of being a full vested participant in this framework, only about 5% could actually claim full personhood status. So another way to say this is that the founding of this country for all its fantastic rhetoric, for all the beautiful concepts that we're taught as children, it's really a founding violence in its implementation. It's obviously a founding violence against the indigenous who were subject to intentional deliberate genocide, murder, on purpose, right? It's a founding violence against those Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun or the point of a spear and forced to build this country because this country was built with slave labor. The White House that Barack Obama currently occupies was built by slaves, and by enslaved people. I beg your pardon, enslaved people. In fact, can we no longer say runaway slaves? Anytime that comes up in conversation, let's call them what they really were self-liberated human beings. It's a different way to think about it. And it's a founding violence against women. Because it's not just that women couldn't vote, it's that women were not fully vested persons under the law. They couldn't enter into contracts, they couldn't vote, they couldn't own property. Women were property. By every understanding of that, women were subjugated. And it's a founding violence against most of the white men because they, most of them were actually indentured servants as well. In fact, the great historian Howard Zinn said, one way to look at US history is by a series of struggles by ordinary groups of human beings to be legally defined as persons under the Constitution. So some people might say, all right, Cobb, <coughs> you got a scathing indictment about imperialism you know, 500 years ago. You know, you're all bent out of shape about slavery and, and women not being able to vote. But hey, we got rid of slavery. Women can vote. It's all good. To which I say, oh, contraire, mon frere. Because really, in this construct, it's time now to reintroduce the idea of the corporation. And in order to do so, let me ask this question. Does anybody know what it takes to form a corporation in New Jersey today? About 125 bucks, you file some paperwork, and as long as your I's are dotted, your T's are crossed, and your check clears, the New Jersey Secretary of State will literally rubber stamp and issue you a corporation. I'm a corporation. Okay. So, how long will that corporation last? Forever. Forever, as long as you keep paying your annual filing fees. What can you do with the corporation under New Jersey law? Anything that is legally permissible. And some of us say, well, apparently, if I'm paying attention, you can also do a whole lot of illegal shit and get away with it, too. And the largest of those corporations, the transnational corporations, have become the dominant institution of our culture. They are literally shaping how we think, how we live, how we play, how we work, virtually everything about our lives. Now, in 1789, what would it take to form a corporation? Does anybody know? You had to get a bill introduced in the lower house and it had to pass by a majority. Then that same bill had to go to the upper house and it had to pass by a majority. And then the governor had to sign it. Does that sound like anything you know of? <laughs> a law. Anybody here tried to lobby to get a law passed? I have. Raise your hand. How hard is it? Hard. hard. Real hard. <laughs> right? I mean, it's very difficult. And the point I'm making is that
that there was a time in this country that it was very difficult to create a corporation. And not only that, that's just the mechanics of it. In order to make the application, you had to prove and assert that there was a public need that was not being met either by private business or by existing governmental action. So you had to identify a public need and all you were ever able to do with your corporate charter was to satisfy that public need. If you were ever found to be doing anything above what your corporate charter had been granted for, it was revoked. Your corporate charter would be revoked. Oh, and by the way, how long do you think your corporate charter would last? Five years, ten years, the most, most of them were twenty years, but they were all very limited on how long they could last. Oh. And if you were ever found to act outside the public interest, even during that time period, even if you were doing what you were supposed to be doing, but what you said you were going to do, satisfying this public need, uh, somehow uh, worked a, a public disservice, like, I don't know, polluting the air or the water or killing people. <laughs> do you know what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Revoked. Just like today. Just like today. <laughs> Except how it's not. It's just like that, except how it's not at all. The point I'm making is I want us to think about the corporation. And if this is helpful, and I hope it is, this framework, uh, and if I'm correct that there's a difference between being sovereign and subordinate, if I'm correct that there's a difference between rights and duties, and I am, hmm. then it's worth asking where should a corporation go on this framework? Well, it's, it can only be created by a state action issuing a charter. That charter can actually describe the duties of what it should do. We could hold it accountable either through revocation proceedings uh, or otherwise as an instrument of the state. It should always be acting in the public interest. Can you see my point that I'm making that properly understood a corporation actually should be on this side of the line? And so, when the U.S. Supreme Court says, oh no, we're going to say a corporation should be actually considered a person with constitutional rights, it perverts this whole framework. The idea of corporate personhood is not just a strange idea. It's not, which it is. It's not just that it's illogical, which it is. The principle of corporations claiming constitutional rights is a core bedrock doctrine for how the ruling elite have hijacked our ability to have a functioning democratic republic. If we really want to actually be able to create the society that most of us want, we're going to have to come to terms with the fact that lawyers and the federal courts and the ruling elite have literally hijacked our constitution, they're turning it against us, and they're legalizing most of the harm and the oppression. And so, what I'm saying is, we actually need today a movement. A movement that will transcend political parties, a movement that will transcend ideologies, and actually say, actually, we've got to get to first principles. We, the people, are supposed to be a self-governing people. We are supposed to have the authority to make the decisions on how our overall society operates. This idea is not just a law. It's not just one court decision. It is a bedrock legal doctrine for how the ruling elite have hijacked our courts, our legal system, and I think it's time for we the people to step up and take it back. Peace. Yeah. All right. So a bunch of hands going up. So what I'm going to ask, hold on one second. I want to let you all know that there is in fact a movement and it's sweeping the country. You know, we guess how many times that I, either I or Move to Amend, the coalition promoting this, have been covered by corporate media? No. Not. <laughs> and yet, we have collected over 128,000 others just like you in this movement. It cuts across party lines, it cuts, cuts across ideology. So I'm going to invite you, if you would like to join this movement, sign up. This is not a petition that we're planning on submitting to. Uh, uh, Joanne, can we, put the, uh, or can we take this to the back? Or Miro, if you'll start that in the back and you get that started there. If you don't want to sign up, don't. Just pass it. I won't be offended. I'll be surprised. I, I won't understand why you wouldn't want to join the movement, but if you don't, just pass it. That's all right. All I will say is this. Uh, I'm going to do a sec. If you're going to sign up, please print legibly. As an organizer, nothing is more frustrating. All right, so everybody who wants to make a comment or ask a question, raise your hand. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven. You moved over there.
Number seven, anybody else? The reason I'm doing this, number eight, that's a stack. So numbers two through seven, relax. You're going to get to ask your question or make your comments so we can actually all turn our full attention to number one. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had, I want to take our country back. Okay. Okay. And I'm, I'm very concerned, though, about what the real process is that is required. If we, we um, amend the Constitution, which can happen, I know it can happen, because I've seen it happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But if we are talking about amending the Constitution, what is it that we have to do, number one? And number two, is it possible for us to include in this amendment to the Constitution a uh, language that will say something about government being responsible for performing duties so that they can't pass laws that they don't have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this elite system of, of retirement came from that they have. And I'm very concerned. I get emails all the time of people who are concerned about it. And they seem to think that the more people who know about it, it's going to change. But if you don't take action, it doesn't mean anything. So I'm, I think that we need to hold our Congress accountable immediately, in addition to kicking corporations out of the personhood and the protection of our Constitution. And, and I think that that, I mean, I really think that that's going to send a message and will say something to Congress that they will have to deal with because, I mean, even if we kick the corporations out, if they continue to act like the corporations are, the, are going to control them, then we really haven't, we haven't been able to make the change that we need to make. So I think that we've got to, at the same time, hold Congress more accountable to the people and the will of the people than they currently seem to have any understanding of. And I am so pleased that in Wisconsin we were able to come back and take back seats in, in, um, in their state legislature that were reflective of people who were representing our voices. But, if, I mean, I don't care how many people we have in Congress, if Congress is going to continue to act like they don't even care, except for what their corporate masters tell them, then we've got to be able to hold them more accountable. I agree, and I want to tell you that, uh, uh, here's my sense of it. The mechanic, you asked how do we do it, well, the mechanics of, of amending the Constitution or doing anything is, is uh, we could go into if you want, but I think the deeper question I believe that you're asking is how do we actually do this? So I think the first thing that we actually have to do is to be willing to tell the truth to one another and to be willing to actually organize as if we're serious. And so I would tell you this, I would agree with everything that you've just said, and in terms of holding people accountable, I'm going to tell you, regardless of what party somebody is in, you ought to be asking, are they actually for what you're for? Right? I mean, like, and, and stop voting for them. If you are against the war and you say that's what you really care the most about, stop voting for people who are funding that war. But we did that. We, no, we you, kicked, no, we, we didn't. We a bunch of people out, but then they don't care. Because now they've got a lifelong retirement where they get paid for no matter what. Well, I and get we shouldn't have to continue to pay people who aren't working for us anymore. I agree if with you. If we kick them out and we fired them, then why do we have to continue to pay them? Because Democrats and Republicans have created a system by which they get lifetime retirement. Well, we Both can, parties we did it. Amend the Constitution to change that. Okay, Muriel, but the point I'm making is that move to amend. What we're saying is it, one amendment is not going to get the job done. If you actually go to our website, you'll see we're calling for a democracy movement. Joanne, let me, uh, before I go uh, any further, this is going to come around, right? How much did I charge you to come here today? Nothing. Nothing. And the reason I say this is because... We need, I need, Move to Amend needs to continue to take this on the road. And so, as that comes around, if you're able to write a check, the organization that I actually do this work with is called Democracy Unlimited. And the reason I interrupted you, Joanne, is because I actually want to make a big deal about the fact that we've got to fund our own liberation. 
Nobody's going to do it ourselves. So just take, just pass that around. If you're going to be, if you can write a check, it's to Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County, right? And I also want to say, as you're considering this, uh, I make 10% of the money that I used to make as a as a successful trial lawyer. I don't say that, and I I don't say it to make you feel sorry for me. I'm about 10 times happier. So it's not that. I say it so you'll be generous to put money in there. And if, you can, if you're going to mail it, or if you don't have your checkbook today, but you would like to make a donation, P.O. Box 610 in Eureka, California. Now, Muriel, I agree with you that we need, I, I guess what I would say is, here's what I think. I think we need a broad movement that's actually articulating that we need to reorganize our society. We need a new social contract. Uh, and frankly, one of the things that I'm most excited about, what if we said not only can only human beings claim constitutional rights, what if we had a movement that actually said, and by the way, we're simply going to assert that a new social contract, that everybody has the right to health care. What if we asserted that everybody has the right to enough food to eat in our society? If we, you know, I guess what I'm getting at, Muriel, is I think we ought to start a new conversation and then say, I'm only going to vote for candidates who are actually part of that. But I think that you would find that the people in Congress would be, if they had to be involved in Medicaid, they would have a very different position. Okay, I'm agreeing with you. Yes, so let's make that part of it. So let's make them adhere to the laws that they pass. Okay, I agree. That'd be a good thing. to amend the Constitution. Make that happen. Number two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree perfectly with her, um, but I also know, um, well, one two friends. I I can't add, say one thing without first saying that this is probably the first time I've actually heard someone who ran for president bring up the subject of talking about race in this country today. Not yesterday, not what might be five years from now, but now. Because I usually hear um, uh, some grumbling about always bringing it up. But I think all we have to do um, is think back three weeks ago uh, to a president of the United States being called a tar baby by um, a congressperson so-called from Colorado, who felt no, had no compunction about doing that. Um, and it's, it's not just that, but that one for me, as a black person, stands out just hugely and speaks to the fact that we need to get over in terms of being truthful about what this country has done in the past. It's very hard to get to the future or even the present if you don't even want to acknowledge what has happened in the past on, with all these issues. Uh, not just race, but, but that looms, still looms very high. Um, and I have a question in regard to uh, uh, corp the, the whole corporate thing. Um, and as you know, because we met each other in Washington and we we know that that's, it looms large, not just nationally, but in the nation's capital, which has been consumed by corporate everything. It's, it's just been taken over. Um, you could practically go to the Smithsonian and see, you know, mobile oil or something up in, <laughs> in, in, in every building, every so-called national treasure. Um, I want to know what you think about this, uh, and he's done it in the past, but a corporation known as Warren Buffett, who is insisting that other corporate people pay their fair share. What is that all about? Well, I, I think that the difference is, and I, I, first of all, I thank you for uh, acknowledging or, or, or or continuing the conversation about race and racism. And I do want to say very quickly to white people, white people, we have got to talk about race. White people have got to talk about race and racism. 
And uh, white people, can I get only white people here? Can I get a hell yes that we'll do that from this? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Men only. Hell yes. Hell yes. Men, we will talk about sexism. Hell yes. Hell yes. Yes. All right. So this is the thing. Like that. That actually needs to be talked about. And not like we need to actually bring that up. Now I wanted to address your very specific question around Warren Buffett because I think it's an important one. Warren Buffett was speaking as a human being. And even though he's super rich, he actually has a sense of his conscience, he has a sense of his morality, and he's saying this isn't right that, like, the super rich should act, it should come up to the front, I think is, is yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the super rich should actually pay their fair share. But a corporation, as a, a transnational corporation, would never be able to say that under the law. And I think that's the difference, Gail. It also goes to show corporations actually aren't people. They don't have hearts, they don't have, or they don't have hearts, they don't have minds. You know, they, they, they're not people. So what I think is going on is that Warren Buffett is having a pang of conscience. Straight, pure, pure and simple. And I think actually any human being can actually do that. And, and even if I vehemently disagree with another human being, at least I can look them in the eye and have a conversation. And if I'm willing to, I can shut my own mouth and open my ears and try to actually listen to them. You know, and we can actually confront one another and grapple with one another as human beings and try to understand each other. You can't do that with concentrated capital. This is part of the problem with this idea of enshrining corporations as if they have rights. Because when I said the Constitution doesn't create rights, it just recognizes rights, it's like this. Hold on. Can you all see that? That's my belly button. <laughs> if you're too shy to check here in a public place, go home and check and make sure you have one. Because if you do, you're also a human being with enshrined and protected human rights. And the thing is, Gail, what, what really like, gets to me is that Warren Buffett has a pang of conscience as a human being, even though he's a multi-billionaire, and so he's calling for changes in policies based on his humanity. A corporation can't do that and will never do that. And I think that's why everything is sort of tied up in the, uh, how we've created a corporatist class. And frankly, we're, we're, we're enshrining and protecting a kind of predatory behavior. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Number three. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You oh, put up this hey, Tim, can I get a, uh, I had a lemonade here, but I lost it's it. Right here. It's in the front. Right oh, right. thank you. Yes, ma'am. You put up this chart where humans on one side have rights mm -hmm. and government has duties. But I think that it's important. Well, I've just been reintroducing re myself to John Adams, mm -hmm. for example. And the reason they were able to do what they were able to do was because they not, did not consider themselves merely to have rights, that they considered themselves very much to have duties. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to shape their entire lives around that concept of duty. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons that uh, America has allowed itself to be taken over by corporations is because we have lost that. And I would like for us to change that language as well. Well, thank you. I, thank you for saying that. I'll actually have to think about that because uh, under the constitutional framework, um, the rights and duties, I think I'm probably still right, but I also think that you're making a very profound and important uh, idea that we do have duties. In fact, I can share with you, I, I tried to lay this out with uh, 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 Tio Oros Peters, who's the executive director of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indian Development. And you should know, I have a long history uh, with Tia. Uh, you know, she's my, she's my friend, she's my ally. You know, we, we are very close. And she listened and she said, you know, David, I can understand why this corporate personhood thing bothers you and I can understand what you're into. But what you have to understand from my culture, she's an indigenous woman, she said, Rights doesn't even, like, we wouldn't even think of it that way. I mean, we talk about responsibility. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the main thing. We have a responsibility to ourselves, to our society, to Mother Earth. You know, like, everything is about responsibilities. And so I hear what you're saying, and let me let, me let that percolate, because I think that, and I've been trying to incorporate that, and now I'm just talking directly to you. I've been trying to incorporate what Tia said whenever I talked about that moral outrage, that there's a responsibility to end, end hunger, a responsibility to dismantle racism and sexism, and, but I don't think I've been explicit enough, and I'm gonna think about that. Thank you. Number four. Oh, yeah, um, I have a two-part question. Part one is, are you advocating resetting everything to 1789, where corporations basically go away unless they're chartered, 
or are you advocating for a change in the rights that corporations have as they exist today? Okay, that's fair enough. But remember this, that first and foremost, uh, corporations cannot come into existence without a charter. Yes, but it's easy as opposed to being hard as it was in 1780. So what I'm saying is this, that we ought to have a public debate on the proper role of the corporation in our society. I think that, that corporations should and can uh, play important roles, but I do think that they should be more tightly restricted and regulated. And I'm saying that clearly they should never be able to claim constitutional rights. In fact, what I'd like to do is actually uh, pass out, this, this is the, the brochure that we're actually using to try to show you some of that language. And on the back, what you'll see are three concepts. It's not just corporate personhood, but it's also uh, the, the idea of, we think actually we definitely need a uh, constitutional amendment to codify the right to vote. Do you know we don't have a federal right to vote? Bush versus Gore. Um, exactly. So, so the answer is yes, we don't think corporations should be able to claim constitutional rights. That's, that's part of it, for sure. Uh, for part two, uh, my presumption is that in 1789, groups like churches were not corporations? That's correct. What were they? Oh, well, they were entities. I mean, they were... Yeah. And you are, I hope, keeping in mind the fact that soup kitchens and churches and the Red Cross are also corporations today. Sure. Well, here's what, how I would answer that question. I think only actual living human beings have innate human rights. That these other entities should have legal rights, but those legal rights are subject to the political process. So they're, but they're not set by the Constitution. They're, they're, not, they're not guaranteed human rights. So we should actually have meaningful public discussion about the institutions that we create in order to make things happen. That's a reasonable discussion. And I'm not saying that everybody's going to agree with me. You know, d democracy doesn't mean David Cobb wins. You know? Unless you're telling a story. Unless I'm telling a story. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> But I, mean, I guess what I'm saying is that what we need to do is actually create a, a, a civil society where we're able to actually have that conversation. Uh, you were four? Yeah. Number five? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I came in really late in the end, so I don't really, I may I say something already said that you can interrupt me. Um, first of all, I think it's great that you want to amend the Constitution, but I feel like that's something that's kind of fallen out of the conversation for the left. I think what you see a lot of times is Tea Party people on the right want to change the Constitution and not enough on the progressive side of the spectrum, um, which actually wasn't always the case because back you know, a century ago or so, progressives were at the forefront of amending the Constitution with, of course, women's suffrage being the most important. And also, the, uh, well, it's the big, the big, the big how progressive it was, but the amendment bringing the, uh, the in, 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 uh, income state uh, tax. Income tax. Anyway, um, the second thing I wanted to say was that I still think it's easy to think it's abstract and they look at what's the role of corporations, but it is concrete in people's lives and their livelihoods because right now, for instance, there's this enormous strike going on with Verizon workers, 45,000 of them, and basically the company is saying that you know, your current livelihood, you can't, you can't afford it anymore. But, the, but the, the CEO and the shareholders, uh, you know, the big shareholders, can make millions. Exactly. And 50, that's $55,000 a day. <laughs> Actually, Verizon just gave $10 billion to Verizon, Verizon Wireless right now. $10 billion. So, I'm sorry, continue. No, and that's something that I think this, this can dovetail nicely into, right? This can start a conversation, and it'll be a long-term process in the Constitution, but that, it always is. In the meantime, it'll, it'll feed into other movements, for instance, of uh, organized workers trying to just defend that, just defend rights they already have, let alone expand new ones. And I'm glad you bring that up because I do want to underscore something. This idea that corporations can claim constitutional rights, it is used to overturn worker protection laws. If you go to the website movetoamend.org, you will find case after case after case where worker protection laws get overturned, where consumer safety laws get overturned, and campaign finance laws get overturned. This is how, and not only do laws get overturned, but then our legislators are cowed into thinking, well, we can't do that because the court told us we can't do that anymore. And so today, 30 minutes.
So I guess the point I'm making is I think the reason that I'm proud to be part of Move to Amend is because we need to take ourselves seriously. If the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and we really want to be a movement that's actually playing for real, then we got to actually engage that. And we make a mistake if we let the right wing be the only people who say that they want to actually talk about first principles. So I thank you for bringing that up. And I think that especially what I thank you for doing is making it very concrete. Right? How does this affect your life? Every way you can imagine. Corporate America is actually influencing us in almost every way that we can imagine. And so we need a movement that's actually going to not only fight back, but be proactive and actually describe the different world that we want to live in. And I think we can do that. Number six. Hi. Hi. Uh, you were talking about that. You had conversations with uh, the Tea Party people. I've had many with my own relatives who are Tea Party uh, individuals. And they, we, we have some really commonalities, and then it veers off into, you know, uh, never, never land, you know, and uh, so, but I just try to understand the Tea Party creature. I, you know, because a lot of times they'll break it down very much like you have done, except for the communitarian part. They just kind of think it's all individual responsibilities and things like that. What's your sense? How they, you know, they have come on scene and and really have captured a lot of people. And there's a lot of sympathies that people have towards that. So what's your sense of uh, how they came to be? And, you know. Well, as, first of all, uh, that's a complex question. So I don't think that we can say that there is one Tea Party adherent, first and foremost. I mean, that's a simplification. Uh, there, uh, the second thing that I think that we have to understand is that I believe that corporate media and hundreds of millions of dollars of Koch Brother Industries corporate money founded the Tea Party. <laughs> Like, you know, like with $100,000, I could put on a much better show than the Tea Party did. For real. In fact, the anti-war movement put a million of us out on the streets, you know, without any corporate money. So I think it's important to realize that without Fox Media and ABC, NBC, and CBS, the, quote, Tea Party movement wouldn't exist. So that's one thing. But I do think that what is clear is that it, that sentiment is actually widespread. There is an anger about feeling a lack of control over our own institutions. Uh, and I share the fear and the suspicion of concentrated power of the hands of the federal government that's unaccountable. I also recognize, though, that the transnational corporations are probably playing an even more direct role in oppressing us and, and, uh, uh, and unaccountably doing so. And that's where I try to actually have those conversations you know, when you're having a conversation with somebody, if it's a real conversation, you're trying to communicate. And that means you need to speak in the language that they understand. And for some people, you're never, like even if you speak the same language, you're not really communicating. And whenever I come across somebody who's really not trying to communicate or actually listen to me or actually communicate with me, I've got four magic words. Have a nice day. <laughs> I've just decided, like, it's very clear that there are some people that are not interested in real communication, real dialogue. They just get into a sectarian position and spout it over and over again. Have a nice day. I got, you know, there, I've got conversations to have. I've got people to love. I've got joy to, to create. I've got reasons to be, you know, happy. And so for some of the Tea Party people, have a nice day. Now, for those that are really willing to engage you in conversation, and you want to, and you want to understand them, and I say this with absolute respect to you, then stop talking and listen to them. And, you know, try to figure out where that commonality is. I mean, I wish I had something more useful to say, but if you want to understand somebody, listen. Uh, number, you were six? Number seven, Tim. Yes. Um, Thanks for coming, y'all. First question um, is first question is very simple. Um, is that the reason the corporation is supposed to be for the public good? Is that why I see all these signs around for when uh, municipalities and counties were incorporated at such and such a time? Mm -hmm. All right. Then, uh, and as far as uh, the uh, racism part, 
in my, I've worked for the County Board of Social Services for over 30 years, and at one time, I think it was a, a form of economic uh, racism, but now with this economy and over the 30 years, it's more like, like an economic slavery for just the uh, working person or just the uh, middle and lower class, because I have not seen in Cam Camden, I have not seen one uh, viable job industry come into that city, or the, or the freeholders bring a industry, always high tech, corporate job, and um, so, okay, you know, that, that's, that's why I, I, I don't think it's only racism anymore. You, like you say, corporations don't have consciousness, so it's more just to keep people in control. Well, I think that's right. I mean, uh, uh, today, I, I, down. I, I will say that, that uh, let's say it this way. You know, I grew up in poverty. I grew up in rural poverty. And rural poverty is different than urban poverty, to be sure, but it's still poverty. Uh, and uh, it ain't great. And uh, I realized that the, somehow I just it, like, could see and intuited that the economic system was unfair and unjust. Uh, but as a white male, I kind of bought the rest of society. And also, as a progressive, I remember I used to say to myself, man, I wish that black folks and women would just get over it because it's really just the economic system. You know, like that, I really believe that. And luckily, I had worked together with a woman uh, who was an African-American who I had developed enough trust with and a love relationship with that I could actually tell her. Because see, I would never say that out loud because I was smart. And I realized that you couldn't really say that and, and work on the society that I wanted to work on, but I thought that, you know. And I'll never forget, uh, Serena, like I told her that and she said, damn David, I, like, I know you, I know who you are. and I know what you think you're saying out of your lips, but I wish you could hear what I'm hearing in my, head, in my ears because when you complain about identity politics and how if we'd all just get together and work on economic uh, issues, that, that then we'd win and that, that then we'd all win, she said, David, you know what I'm hearing? Serena, you don't count. Your life experience, you don't understand reality. She said, David, have you ever thought about the fact that you think economics and class is the most important thing is because that's your identity and that my identity as a woman and as a person of color has also equally valid and I'll tell you something Tim my knees buckled my, my the world spun around I mean like I guess what I'm getting at is this I think it's still inextricably linked because really what we're talking about is oppression and whether it's economic oppression or racial oppression or gender oppression anytime you're seeing somebody engage in a dominator system where they're trying to bash somebody down and impose something over them that's oppressive by its nature and I actually want to be part of a new political movement that is both righteously outraged and joyous. I want to be part of a power with dynamic where we actually figure out how we actually engage one another. And so, yes, economic slavery is part of it, but it's not the only thing. Racism and sexism and, uh, and classism are all still linked in the sense of a dominator predator class. Oh, absolutely. So, so I'm agreeing with I, I you. Know, right. I don't disagree with what, what's going on. I'm just saying from my perspective, my job, this is what I've seen over the past 30 years. Yes, I, and, I, I, and I think that a lot of people are seeing that. And then the last thing I want to say is, is this. If there is anybody here who has been moved by this presentation, I want to let you all know that we have now over 25 affiliates of Move to Amend happening at the local level. Yeah. I have here a local action toolkit. It's got a greeting to you from... Uh, the Democracy Unlimited, from the Black Agenda Report, from the Center for Media and Democracy, from Progressive Democrats of America, the Alliance for Democracy, and all the National Steering Committee groups. We have over 100 different organizations who have come on board. Uh, it's got a Declaration of Independence from Corporate Rule, how you can get more materials, how you can affiliate as a local group with Move to Amend. And I want to ask, is there anybody here that says, you know what, I literally want to actually make Move to Amend something that I'm going to start organizing on? Nick Malice, I thought it might be you, brother. Thank you, Nick. Sure. Nick Malice, everybody. Nick is going to be.
Oh, I'm so sorry, Steve. We got another question, and I, and I beg your pardon, Steve. You were number eight. You were on the yeah, stack. Yeah, and, and I don't know. Uh, the library's open until nine. I don't know if you want to take more on the stack than for me. But yes, I'll do another round. Yeah, um, my name is Steve Wilson. I'm the Green Party candidate for state assembly in the 14th uh, district this year. Um, David was the Green Party candidate for uh, president in 2004. And David, I wish you would consider one of these cycles. Repeating that and being the Green Party candidate for president again. We need it, president. <laughs> but my question. Yes. My question goes to something that you said very passionately uh, towards the end, where you, you were, we should say to the corporations, you're out and we've got a better plan. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we, I, probably it would take a whole nother night, but I'd like to just start to hear your thinking about the other plan that you have in mind, okay. the alternative. The alternative, all right. So here's the, the alternative, I think, and, and I will actually, uh, this was not a set up question. Steve did not know I was going to do this. But Steve is also uh, the co-editor and publisher of Green Horizon Quarterly, which actually is dedicated to actually outlining the other plan. And the other plan, actually, uh, I believe the Green Party's platform actually covers it. And I'll break it down very quickly. Uh, the, the plan that I would actually have is to say, look, we need meaningful productive work for which we will be acknowledged, and that productive work ought to actually be about creating a, a racially, socially just society, and it needs to be actually in keeping with the physical reality of the world. That is to say, we can't cons continue to consume the resources. We have to decentralize power down to the local level, making sure always that individuals' human rights are protected and that the local government uh, cannot actually uh, interfere with individual rights. How would we do that? Actually, I think that we're already seeing examples of it. The Mondragon Collectives, for example, where meaningful productive work is taking place, they're producing goods and services, and they are meeting people's needs. I think that we also could imagine a situation where not only is meaningful work being done, but that we actually begin the process of creating our play differently, where we don't engage in a celebrity uh, sort of culture, where we just look for somebody on high and clap to, but instead we actually start to engage uh, in a whole different way. We, like, I guess it, it would take all of a, a, you know, it would take more than even the, another evening, but if we actually just started to imagine like how we would like to live, I don't think that anybody would be creating these kinds of institutions. And I'll say this, Democracy Unlimited, I live in a workers' collective. We, uh, there are those of us who live upstairs and downstairs. We have both living space and community organizing space. We catch water off of the roof. We, we keep chickens and ducks. Uh, we grow uh, vegetables and a fruit orchard and raspberry bushes. You know, we, we, we actually administer not one but two community-supported agriculture programs for local organic farmers. We're the administrators and the drop-off point for it. We run a community currency project. We have a local independent business alliance. I mean, if you, if you really want to see it, just go to duhc.org and check it out. Like, like, that's actually our plan. And we're doing it, Steve, and I think you'll especially appreciate this because it's community-based. I think at the end of the day, wherever we live, work, and play is where it has to start happening. And when we actually create uh, examples of what that looks like, and we do it in a joyous fashion where we actually can show that you can get your needs met without screwing other people over or destroying the planet, other people will want to participate in that. And we don't like try to push it on anybody. We're just doing it, and we're drawing more and more people in. And I think that that's how it would work. So I got, I, I, if you haven't been asked a question, I'm going to let that go uh, first. One, two, three, four, and then five and six. And then we're going to have to wrap it up. One. I just wanted to ask you what your sense is. I get the sense lately that everything's kind of, the planets are aligning for the progressives. Um, I'm active with Move On there, but I counted 10 Move On members in the audience. And Move On saying now it's the contract for the American dream, which is similar to what the gentleman in the back was talking about with <coughs> workers and some mm -hmm. of the things you've talked about. And it just gives me a really good feeling that it seems like all the progressive things that I'm hearing lately all seem to be funneling the same way. And what you talked about, obviously, is like the kind of the clearest channel. Well, thank you for that. And I will say this. There is no doubt in my mind that, that progressives are beginning to speak with a narrative, the same kind of narrative. 
What we, yeah, and that's a good thing. What we haven't yet done is actually figured out a strategy. And I think that that's actually important. So, you know, uh, ultimately, that's, that, that, we're going to have to crack that nut, too. But the first thing is to actually get involved in telling the same story. And so that's a good thing. And, and so we're moving forward. Thank you, for, okay. thank you for that comment. I agree with it. Number two. The, annual, the first annual democracy convention in Madison. <laughs> I like how you said that, first annual. Your, your uh, tour is winding up there. It is. What conference are you part of? 15 minutes. I am actually organizing the Constitutional Reform Conference. And do you know when your major presentation will occur? Friday and Saturday is uh, uh, the, the, the key component parts of that. And then on uh, Sunday uh, morning, uh, I and the rest of the Move to Amend are actually having the, the closing plenary where we say, look, whether it's media reform or military or health care uh, or economics, if we're going to take ourselves seriously, we need a con a, a, an effort to amend the Constitution in a progressive fashion. And so on Sunday is the final, final one on that. Thanks for asking. And the Democracy Convention is going to be off the hook. A thousand registrants already, and you know, we're growing and people are coming in. We, we have the very uh, exciting difficulty of actually overselling the hotel. Like, it's, it's book solid. We're, now we're scrambling to, to find more places for people. So this movement is taking off. And you know what, sister? You're right. This, is, this narrative is catching hope. Number three. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to uh, bring up here uh, about oh, eight years ago, we had a group, Carol Gay and I, and a maybe some other people in the group, We should actually acknowledge who that was. A Green Party candidate. And not a candidate, a Green Party <laughs> Assembly legislator, Matt Ahern, actually introduced that bill. Yep. Yeah. I mean, so folks, you know, electing Greens can actually have a lot of effect. And he was the only one who would. How about that? <laughs> Things that make you go, hmm. 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 Hey, there you go. So, yes, and I guess the, the sister makes a very important point. I mean, I don't want to get hung up on, on Matt, uh, although he's a, he was a great legislator and we were proud of him in the Green Party. But the point that she's making, I want to really underscore, actually, if we had a movement that actually would take itself seriously, we could define how corporations ought to be conducting themselves, not just how they ought to be conducting themselves, how they must conduct themselves. If there was an actual movement that took itself seriously, we would say, if you're not on board with this, you're not on board with us. If you won't support us, we won't support you. And that's actually the, the refrain that I wish that people would be taking to all of their political functions. Green, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian. I think that this needs to be part of the discussion in the body politic. And, and good on you for uh, acknowledging wealth confront Obama with this uh, resolution, confront him and ask him to sign. Yeah, and I, I'd like to, you know, everybody's making fun of Mitt Romney. I'd like to actually ask some Democrats, too. Do you think corporations are people? I think it's a reasonable question. Who's number four? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, is there something within the program to confront the media 
Did you get the cover moved to an end? Yes. Uh, it, it, well, at the Democracy Convention, we actually have a Democratizing the Media as a full conference. And so we're actually trying to do that. And I would say this. I, I see that the, uh, the, the gentleman here, are you actually from the, the, the local media? Independent photographer. Oh, well. Uh, so uh, I will say this, that what we need to do, I, in my humble opinion, is that we need to start creating our own media. If you're listening to this, if you're watching me right now, it's because we did this ourselves. Nick Mellis did it ourselves. Don't hate the media. Become the media. We've got to actually start to create our own media. Cut it out there. Green Horizon Quarterly is a good example of it in print form. Use the internet. In fact, if all of you who are moved by this, if you signed this petition, friend me on Facebook so that I can check up on you and check that you, in fact, posted movetoamend.org on your Facebook page. Right? Like, let's use social networking in a very powerful and profound way. So, yes, we need to confront corporate media to make them cover this, and we need to make us a story on our own. So go ahead and follow up. I see you. Let's Yeah. Hey, Nick, Nick, can you get this on public access? Well, actually, I had a show on public access several years ago, and I'll, I was planning on renewing uh, the show. Well, so, yeah, got, we can have this you've on. You've got the film. Don't put it on. So, yeah. put it on. George oh, George so, is, folks? George um, used George to hang out with a green in Philly, so sure. So, here we go. <coughs> www.movetoamend.org. Check us out on the web, and there is a local chapter in New Jersey, and it's growing. You need to get involved, too. Peace. So, uh, you got to follow up very quick. Yeah, yeah. 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 So if you could help get me in touch with them, I'd like to actually pitch them on that story. Number five. Decide yes, ma'am. Delegate responsibilities. What people want to do. Okay. And yes, ma'am. Because I don't. You can find me on the web. Just Google Nick Mellis. I just need to be able to say to people, what does it mean and where is it going? Okay, well, uh, the short answer is what does it mean M is we, we want to actually build a democracy movement in the United States that means corporations cannot control your life. Yes. All right. Not that one. And what it, would, what it would mean is that we would be able to have a different society. But what, no, I'm saying uh, I don't, the, the signing of the petition, All right. what does that represent? And where where do the, the petitions go? The petitions would actually go to move to amend. What we're doing is contacting them. We're trying to build a movement. It's sort of like this. Dear, like SNCC, uh, uh, we're, we're, when they were organizing together, they were actually saying we're trying to get enough people to actually confront this whole system. That's actually what we're trying to do as well. So we're not actually sending it. That's the point I was making. We're not going to take this to Congress. Okay, so it's not actually an amendment. No, it is an amendment. Movement. It's an amendment yeah. movement, but what we're saying is that the current Congress is not going to pass this. The people who are going to pass this are not in Congress right now, but they are born. Oh, right? Right. So what are you going to do with the petition? We're going to call you. We're, I mean, like, this is the point. We're going to contact you. We're going to try to get you self, like we're self-organizing, uh, and we're, 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 going to, we're, we're going to try to build a progressive movement. Uh, David, with the names and numbers you gave me, um, or hopefully will give me to organize this. Yes. Um, I'd like to, um, when I contact you, we're going to get a uh, conference call going so we can all talk about responsibilities and what everyone wants to do to help. Um, the it's a volunteer effort, so um, it's more than just writing a check. It's actually feet on the ground. And, uh, it's got to be. It's got to be. And thank you, Nick, for volunteering. Oh, yes, last one. Sorry, Gail. Uh, I was just going to say, and it's interesting that Nick was saying the feet on the ground, and you mentioned SNCC. Um, they just had their 50th anniversary mm -hmm. last year. It was incredible because the person who coordinated it said we expected maybe 350 people, and they ended up with over 1,500 down at Shaw University, where it all got started. Um, and I, I'm, I'm saying all that to say, um, as she was talking about not being able to get the attention of Congress or whatever, and it's, it's on kind of a humorous note in a very serious way. Back
back when the Million Man March happened. No matter your politics or ooh, I don't like this or whatever. That was the one day that I saw from 4.30 in the morning right up until noon. I had never seen Capitol Hill so deserted. You could have done anything you wanted to. You could have run every red light going down Constitution Avenue. The fear of a million black men <laughs> coming, I mean literally, I, I couldn't believe it. There were a few brave souls yeah. hanging out of windows to see what was going on. But they were so afraid of looking at a sea of black males starting from the Capitol and going all the way back uh, to the reflecting pool, scared them to death. They would not come into Washington from their homes in Virginia and Maryland. And I'm just saying that to say that if you, if when you, those numbers do count, mm -hmm. and the sense that oh my God, they're serious, and yeah. scared them to death. And I'll I tell went to Georgetown and had the whole of M Street to myself. And let me and thank you for that. And I would add this that the only thing that probably scares the elites more than a million African-Americans massing together to speak with one voice is if a million African-Americans join with a, a right. million Latinos, join with a million right. white people, right. Right. and we're actually marching together, yes. that will scare the ruling elites. That's right. They want to stay in there. <laughs> right. They want to stay in there. And that's what we got to do. Peace. Do you have time? Can I ask you oh, one favor? I'll stick around, but the library is closing, so we need to start. But if one you favor. Can you, I'd like to take a picture of you with that sign. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Excellent. And, and now watch this. You got me? Yeah. I got you. All right. So, is this really what the Democratic Party in New Jersey is going to be all about? Consider the Green Party. We are the alternative. Peace.